Well, welcome, welcome to Church of the Rock, our various campuses. Those that are online. We're glad that you're here. Through this past week, I've been reading through the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 11, there was a verse that kind of jumped out at me. Paul is writing, he says, I magnify the ministry so that in some way I might provoke my fellow brethren to jealousy. And he's talking about how he, he wants to magnify what God is doing in his life. So somehow the Jewish people, those, his fellow brethren, those who are in the old covenant, somehow they would come to this desire that they would just want to become believers in Jesus Christ. And so I was thinking about that. I said, so how do I magnify my ministry? Oh, you know, there was this time when I laid hands on people, person, and they were just healed by the power. I thought, no, that might not provoke anybody to jealousy. They might just think, yeah, you boastful, arrogant person. I, or, you know, I'm thinking, oh, um, oh there, there's this time I just talk about when the presence of God came, and I'm just sensing God. It's just so wonderful. It's just, oh, oh God, you're so... Would that provoke anybody to jealousy, or would they just think, you wacky person, you're a kook? What, what would provoke the people around us to jealousy that they would say, I want what you got? What is the story of your life that is so intriguing, so wonderful, so beautiful that they would say, this is what, I've got to get this thing. I've got, you've got something about your life. I just got to get this. What is it? Or is there anything? If people were to look at their life and say, eh, you know what, I'd prefer to hang around with somebody else because you don't got anything that I want. Is there something about our life? What is the story of our life? And in the scriptures, we actually find that God is really into stories. His word is all a story. It's a story of God dealing with mankind, how mankind was created so that we could have a relationship with him. And then all through the scriptures, we have just about a chronological account of God working to bring mankind into a living relationship with him. And then how we can walk out such a relationship, which is different, by the way, than if you were to read the Quran. If you were to read the Quran, the Quran has only got three or four complete stories in the whole book, and most of it are just sayings here and there. And the sayings are rather, they actually don't make any sense unless you know the background. If you don't know the Hadith and the Syrah, which is the traditions of Muhammad and the biography of Muhammad, you have no way of understanding what most of the Quran is. You need those, those pieces of information to puzzle it together. Matter of fact, the Quran is not even written. The Bible in most parts is is chronological in order. But in the Quran, it's not chronological in order. And in the Quran, the, the Islam has what is called abrogation. And that just means that latter verses, the ones that are re recent, recent, more recent to ourselves, the latter verses can abrogate or replace other verses. So if there's, if there's a section of the Quran that talks about loving your enemies and being at peace, if that was written before a verse that later on talks about making war with your enemy and overcoming them and killing them and slaughtering them, then the latter verse would abrogate the former verse. And then it's important because then you need to know what was taking place when Muhammad received these verses. So you have to know his biography and you need to know uh, the, his, his likes and dislikes and you have to know all of that when you're reading through the Quran because some sections of the Quran were written when Muhammad was in Medina and some were written in Mecca and the two sections, one was an area of peace and one was an area of war and they don't, they're not chronological by the way. And so, but that is so different than the scriptures. Because the scriptures are consistent all the way through about the heart and the nature of God. God is into storytelling. It matters so much so that uh, Jesus, scripture says that when he was talking with the people, the common people, he always talked in stories and in parables. Why is that? Because he knew that people would remember the story. They might not know all these great details of the teachings, but they would catch the inference behind the story, and they'd be able to remember that. God is into story. What about your story? What's happening in your story? Is it something that would provoke people so that they would say, I want what you've got? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. There's five points to my message, so I'm going to go quite quickly. Uh, but we're going to be looking at five things here. They come up on the screen here. We're going to talk about how God is the best storyteller. He's the best story weaver. 
Then we're going to be, he's the story writer. Point number two, that you're a key part of your story. You're people, that makes kind of good sense. It's your story. You're a key part of that. Point number three is the choice of the narrative is up to us. Point number four, you get to write your own ending. Point number five, you need to get God's help to finish well. If you found the scripture, please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 1 about our story. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need, as some others, epistles, that's writing stories, of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle, that's our writing, our story, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but in the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. God is the best story writer. That's our first point. He's the best story writer. What does that mean? That means that God, in his great sovereignty, in his great wisdom, in his foreknowledge, and in his ultimate predestination, his powerful predestination, he's able to weave a story in all of our lives. And there's a purpose and a plan in this story in the lives. Now, we don't always understand the details, but he takes each of your lives and he says, I'm going to make a story out of you. Now, in, in the working of God, it, you can say, well, he's predestined everything. There's nothing. It's just going to. No, that's not true. God, pre, the word predestination actually means to have a boundary, to set boundaries and guidelines. And so as I'm preaching right now, there are some boundaries. Our TV crew, the lights people say, don't leave the platform. We don't have lights down there. Stay up on the platform. Don't go preach somewhere else. You might like if I preach somewhere else. You just hear my voice and you don't have to see my ugly face. That's another issue. But they say, no, 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 stay on the platform. And don't walk around so fast because it's hard for the camera to keep up to me. You know, it's just moving around all over the place. But so I have boundaries, but I have lots of mobility here within my platform area. In your lives, there are certain things that God has predetermined, he's preordained. He has preordained that you be living in Winnipeg right now. Now, you might not live in Winnipeg, but you're in Winnipeg right now. And he's, I don't know how you got here, that's another issue, but he's gotten you here. He preordained your background, who your parents would be. He preordained your ethnicity. You didn't get a choice on that. He preordained uh, what economic structure you were born into. Now that can change, depending on there's some flexibility on your part, but he preordained what economic structure you were born into. He preordained the time frame. You weren't born a thousand years ago. You were not born a hundred years from now or next year. You were born whenever you were and you're living right now. He set those parameters. He's the great God. He's the one who makes all the decisions. And sometimes we don't understand. He is the best story writer. He takes the script and he says, this is the best script. But many times in our lives we're saying, why is this happening, God? Why did this happen to me? And we're asking why. And, but we don't always understand why. But he, like a good story writer, takes certain things and he weaves them into the story because he knows that as these things come together, something great and exciting is going to take place. If you were to look through the Old Testament, you would see that in the life of the Old Testament people, there are examples and pictures of Jesus Christ. The people, as they were living the Old Testament, didn't understand what they were looking at. They didn't see how this picture was weaving and showing natures of Jesus Christ, but it does. If you were to look back into Genesis, you would see that the life of Joseph, how he is sold for 30 pieces of silver, how he becomes a slave, and then how he redeems his family is a beautiful example of Jesus Christ who becomes a slave in a sense. It says in Ephesians chapter, Philippians chapter 2, he humbled himself and took upon himself the nature of a slave, even to the point of death. Why? So that he could redeem us. If you were to read through Exodus chapter 12, you would see that there is the, the Passover lamb that is slain. And this is a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. When the disciples, when the disciples, when the Jewish people were sacrificing the Passover lamb, they didn't even think of Jesus. They didn't even think of their Messiah. But we, looking back, see how the great story writer 
takes this thing. This lamb who needs to be set aside one week before it's sacrificed, just as Jesus enters into Jerusalem one week before he is crucified. This lamb who needs to be spotless without blame, perfect in nature, just as Jesus Christ was spotless without blame, perfect in nature. This lamb who was slain, and then the blood of this lamb needs to be applied, not sprinkled on the ground, not poured out on the ground, but needs to be applied to the, the lintel, the doorpost of the house. This Jesus whose blood is not just to be poured out on the ground, but it's applied into the families and lives of each individual. Beautiful parallelisms. But in the Old Testament, they didn't see. But we can see ah, the best story writers putting all these pieces together, how beautiful it is. We can see in the book of, of uh, well, you can see it all over. You can see in the book of Ruth how we have Boaz. Boaz is the great, great, great grandfather of David. Jesus, who comes out of the house and lineage of David. Boaz is, he's, he's known as being the redeemer because he takes Ruth, who is a destined to poverty, and redeems her, brings her into his household and becomes the redeeming kinsman. A beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, who is our redeeming kingsman, who takes us out of situations of destitute nature, buys us back, and redeems us. We see in the book of Isaiah, the Isaiah 53, which talks about the Messiah, the suffering Messiah. The Jews could not comprehend that their Messiah would suffer. They thought their Messiah was going to come as a ruling king who was going to conquer all the nations of the world and establish Israel as the mighty nation of all kingdoms. And yet, Isaiah 53 talks about this one who is suffering, whose face is so disfigured, and by his stripes, don't fall off the platform, my boundary is, by whose stripes we are healed. And yet they couldn't understand that, but we can look back and say, oh, you see, God takes things, and there are things in your life right now that you say, I can't understand that, why is this happening? And God doesn't always tell you why, but he's the best story writer. And he's writing the story with your life and he's weaving things together so that in the end, you'll be saying, wow, God, you really knew what you were doing. Of course he did. <laughs> the scripture says, just uh, give you some scriptures here because there are some scriptures. Ephesians chapter one, verse five, he has predestined us. And I said, he set the parameters. He doesn't dictate all that we have, but he's predestined us according to, uh, that according to the pleasure of his good will. He's, his, it's his good will. He's not some ruthless God. He's there with a stick and I'm going to get you. No, in his good will, he's setting up the pattern of our life and the story of our life so that we can give glory and honor to him. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, that he works all things according to the counsel of his will. He's got this plan, this purpose for our lives, this story that he's writing, a big story of which we get to be a part of it. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he who's begun a good thing in you will perform it all the way until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 12 that Jesus is the author, the author, the writer, and finisher of our faith. It says that he is in John chapter 1, it says, the word, word, words, writing, word, became flesh and dwelt among us. There's something about a story. He is the best storyteller. Point number two. Point number two is, uh, is that point number two? Point number two is, you are a part of your story. You're a key part of your story. That makes sense. <laughs> You're a key part of your story. Now, that's, that's interesting. This is important. You could actually be one of the heroes of your story. Everybody wants to be a hero. How, you can be a hero in your story. Now, ultimately, the hero is God, and you're just a supporting actor. In the, in the big picture of the working of God. But then there's your story. And you are a part of your story. And the key thing is that you are a part of your story. I mean, this is important. It seems so simple. But you're a part of the story. Your story. You get to be a key part. Now, traditionally, in our cultures, what has happened is if you wanted to be uh, an important person, suppose you're a blacksmith. 
You know, 100 years ago, you're a blacksmith. You're there pounding away. You're making these horseshoes. You're straightening them out, making them fit the size of the horse's hoof. You're pounded in there. What nobility and what honor is that? Well, I'm just a blacksmith. No, that's not true. Because traditionally in our culture, when a person had a job, a vocation, whatever it was, whether you're a blacksmith, a baker, whether you're a barber, whether you're a housewife, you could be a person of honor. You could be the hero of your own story. And all it meant is that you had to be a person of honor. You just had to be a person of integrity. You had to be a person who did what was right. And you could then say, I am an upright blacksmith. I never cheat anybody. I don't skimp on the nails that I put on people's hooves. I don't use, you know, improper shoddy, shoddy material. There's a little bit of pun there, shoddy. You know, okay, you might not get that. All right. I don't use shoddy material, but I am an upright, I'm an honest blacksmith. And you could walk through your community knowing that you were an honorable person. But now, in our modern culture, we compare ourselves one with each other and say, you're a blacksmith? You're a caretaker? You're a, you're, you're a sanitary engineer? That's a garbage collector. You're a sanitary engineer? Oh, you do that? No. That's, that's our culture. And matter of fact, in order to make your mark, for you to be a hero in your own story, in our culture, you need to be better than somebody else. You need to be a better athlete. Well, I can't be a better athlete than Derek. I mean, he's good badminton. I'm not. So that, that dismisses that. You know, uh, I, I, I need to be more handsome. Well, no, that disqualifies me. I need to be, I need to be wiser. No, oh, not, not either. I need to have a better education or a higher job, a better level job. Or, or I need to have a, a better spouse or a nicer house or a bigger vehicle. And we're comparing each other. And we get our worth or our significance from looking at somebody else and saying, yeah, well, I might not have the looks, but I sure have the determination. I've got some more strength than that person there. Well, no, I'm more athletic than that. And we compare ourselves. And then we can never be the hero because there's always somebody that's better. But God says those that compare themselves one with each other are not wise. It says that in 2 Corinthians. It says that we're supposed to be those who draw our strength from him. And you see, God says, I want you. This is your story, and you can actually be the hero in a small sense. God is the great hero, but you can be a small sense. This is your story, and you can be the key person. You are the key person in your story, but you can be it, the key person. And it doesn't depend on comparing yourself with others. It depends on the fact that you can say, I'm going to live uprightly. I am going to be an honest person. I am going to let the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith, self-control, I'm going to let those be a part of my life. And whether I'm a blacksmith, whether I, I work in a bank, or whether I, I sweep floors, I, I can be an upright person. And that's what God has for all of you. So you're a key part of your story. Paul says, you know, he says, I don't want to glory in myself, but I want to glory in Jesus Christ. He says, I don't want to make the story all about me. But on the other side is, we're a key part of our story. Um, God is working in our story. He is the one who's in control of all details. When I was, back in 1979, I was in Bible school. And in my year of Bible school, I'd be walking to and from Bible classes. And one of the professors that I really loved, his name was Bob. He had 12 children. And uh, in, in 1979, at the end of the year, he announced to the pastoral staff and the teaching staff and to the students, he said, I'm feeling that I'm supposed to be going to Columbia, Missouri. And I talked with him, I pulled him aside later, and I said, why are you going to Columbia, Missouri? He said, well, I feel that God's calling me there. I just feel it. I said, well, like, do you know somebody there? He said, no, I don't know anybody there. I said, is there a good church there? He said, no, there's no good church there that I know. I don't know of any churches there. I said, well, do you have a job there? He said, no, I don't have a job there. Is this something your wife's going to do? No, there's nothing there. I just feel we're supposed to go to Columbia, Missouri. And in my heart, as he was speaking this, my heart just kind of sank. I had a great admiration, really loved this man. He had a great love for the Word of God. He started four Bible schools. He was teaching the Word of God. And, and I thought to myself, I could never do that. I thought, I could never, 
I could never leave my hometown. I could never leave my loved ones and family and go to some place. I don't even know there's a job. He's got 12 children. How are you going to feed 12 children? How are you going to take care of them? They're in school. How are you going to pay for their tuition? And You're just going there? I thought, God, I could never do that. And I would walk to and from Bible school and I would cry. I'd sob out to God. I said, God, I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability, God. I would love to have the faith to say, God, I'll just go wherever you want. And I'll just take me there and, and no matter what it costs, I'll do it. And I said, God, I could never do that. I said, God, don't ever, don't ever ask me to go someplace where, I, where there's not some security there because I could never do that. A year and a half later, 1980, my wife is pregnant with our first child. Um, and in the middle of the summer, our senior pastor comes up to me and he says, you know, there's a small community in Kenora, Saskatchewan, C-A-N-O-R-A. Uh, there, there's a church there. They need a pastor. They have a little Christian school. They need somebody to oversee the Christian school. We think you and your wife would be the ones who should go pastor this church and oversee the school. We prayed about it in the end of a long story. We felt God was there. Uh, in the middle of July, we then packed up all our possessions into a U-Haul truck and a trader, we pulled it all out there, moved into a little apartment. My wife came back to Regina, that's where we were living before this, and she gave birth to our, our firstborn child, Deborah. As she is giving birth, she gives birth to the child, the child Deborah is born. I go back to Kenora, which is two and a half hours from Regina. I start pastoring the church and working in this school. I'm there for three weeks. At the end of the three weeks, I realize uh, my wife comes to join me after two weeks' time, she, and we, we realize that this church is a very traditional church. I thought it was different. Uh, they are not open to the things of the Holy Spirit. I thought they were. They did not want a charismatic church. I thought they did. They were very legalistic and structured in the way that they were, they were run. I thought it was completely different. I came to the leadership team that had sent me there, my senior pastor. I said, look, at this is the situation of the church. What am I going to do? I, I don't think I can function. I don't think that they're, they're going in this direction. I'm going in this direction. It's completely different. It's not going to work. And they said, you're right, Keith. It's not going to work. I think you should resign. I thought, okay, I'll resign. I'll come back to, win, to, to Regina to live. And he said, no, I think you should start a church. I thought, start a church? I don't know anybody here. I mean, the people I knew weren't going to be in the church. I was resigning from that church. I don't know anybody here. I just go to start a church in a community that I don't know anybody. And I don't know, and I don't have any, yeah, I think that's what you should do. And I thought, okay, I'm here. I have about a $1,000, and that'll give me, live off of that for two months, and then we'll starve to death and die. Okay, that's what we'll do. So... <laughs> Uh, and then I thought, I thought to myself, God, you knew. I had said to you, God, don't ever send me to some place without me knowing what was going to take place beforehand. So he sent me to a place thinking that I knew what was going to take place. When I got there, by hook or by crook, I got there. After three weeks, he pulls the cart up from under my feet, sends me and says, here, new community, start a church. I would never have planned that. But you know what? I did not starve. My family didn't starve. We were there for 14 years. I uh, turned the church over to another pastor who was there for another 10 years. Turned it over to another pastor. The church is still going on to this day. From there, we came here to Church of the Rock 20 years ago, and we've been here helping the church here. I would never have planned that for my life. I didn't have the strength to plan that for my life. I did not have the faith to plan it. But God knew what was best for my life, and he set the circumstances into practice. He says, I've got a play, I've got a plan, I've got a story for your life. I didn't understand it, but he's the best story writer. There are things in your life that you don't understand, but God is the best story writer, and he's trying to weave it all together. The third point is uh, you're in the story. God's the great designer. The choice of the narrative is up to you. Now you say, no, no, God, God doesn't, I have no choices at all. No, no, you actually do have choices. In our life, he gives us some freedoms. There, now you don't have choices where you were born. As I said, your financial background and stuff like that, that's predetermined. God's determined that. But in the midst of that, there are choices. Let me give you an illustration. When I do wedding, officiate weddings, I always talk to the couples and I say, you know, as much as you plan the details of your, your wedding, as much as you want everything to be perfect and you've got all this organized, something's going to go wrong. 
In the weddings that I've officiated, I have had situations where the father has rented this special luxury vehicle just to, bri- to bring the bride up. He just wanted to show off to all his friends. And on the way to the wedding, the vehicle overheats and dies. And the bride is 20 minutes late just getting to the wedding. Actually, this wedding situation it was 40 minutes late. I've been in weddings where, uh, as a matter of fact, that same wedding, <laughs> um, the, the, the clouds developed as the bride is late. And as the bride comes out of the vehicle, it is pouring rain. So much so you can only see two feet in front of you. Had the wedding been on time, the bride would have come through with no rain. But because it's pouring rain, she comes into the service. Her hair that she had gotten up at 7.30 to get nicely primmed and everything just perfect is now just straight and dripping water. Her dress is just in water, and the bottom of it is all muddy because she had to go through the puddles to get into the service for the wedding. Things don't always go well. In my own daughter's, my first daughter, Deborah's wedding, Deborah and Danny, I was able to officiate at the wedding. And for their wedding, Deborah said, you know, for my wedding, I, I would like a blue, a sky blue wedding cake. And I want it to be nice and smooth and just rounded, three layers, you know, made out of fondant icing, just so smooth and rounded. Except they didn't have fondant icing here in Winnipeg at that time. That was back in 2001. She said, I want this wedding cake just to be like this. Our neighbor was overseeing the bakery department at the Safeway store. And he says, you know what, Keith? I'll get my baker to do it. So Friday before the wedding, the baker is making this cake, getting everything together. Saturday is the day of decorating making this cake, putting it all together. And he says, Keith, you know what? We don't let people do this, but I'm going to do this for you because I know you are rushing, you're officiating the service. This is a special day. I am going to bring the cake to the reception just for you. So at noon, he takes the cake out of the Safeway store. He's got on one of these carts. He's rolling it to his van. As he's going across the parking lot, this guy comes wheeling around the corner, hits the cart, just grazes it with his vehicle. The cake falls onto the cement floor, the concrete. He is, uh, he's picking up these pieces. He puts them back on the cart, pulls them back into to the store, shows it to the baker who did the decorating and says, we've got to fix this up. She starts to sob hysterically. She's the baker. The, the decorator is sobbing hysterically. What are we going to do? This is, ah, ah, and, and they just, ah. well, you know what? They got the pieces together. They made some more icing. Now, this was sky blue icing. They had made a huge amount to do the whole cake. Now they're patching it and doing a patch job. They couldn't make the same color. It was not quite, it was a little bit darker, and, but they didn't have much time. They couldn't make trial and error. Make time. So they, they're patching these pieces together. They're putting the second one on, the third one on. They take it. He drives it personally to the reception. This is at one o'clock, 1.30, and the reception's at five. In the heat of the day, this cake, you know the substructure of these pieces on one side where it slid off and hit the, the, is not as strong as the other side that didn't hit. So this has been patched together. There's these three layers. And so this, this cake, by the end of the reception, is more like the leaning tower of pizza, you know. It's caved in. The patch job, you know, it's like somebody smeared butter on in pro- properly, you know, like two different colors of butter because they don't match you know, it's all patched together like this. During the reception, during the wedding service, I officiated it. And it went perfectly until I got to the part I pronounced them husband and wife. And then after I pronounced them husband and wife, uh, I went on to, we're now going to have the candle lighting ceremony. And Danny, my now son-in-law, is standing on the platform. He says, Dad. <laughs> and he, he's doing this fish thing. I'm, <laughs> Dad. Deborah and Deborah, Deborah saying, you forgot, you forgot the kiss, the kissing of the bride. I forgot the kissing of the bride. <laughs> well, now I tell couples, something is going to go wrong in your wedding service. And now for, that means I'll never have any more wedding services. <laughs> Somebody else will get to do that. That's fine. But something's going to go wrong. I said, but you have a choice. You can say, man, that was the worst day of my life. My dad went in this car just to show off to everybody, and the thing stalled. Then I was 40 minutes late, and because it stalled, then the rain came. If I'd have been there on time, I wouldn't have been soaked. But oh no, my dad was in this car. So then I am. I'm soaking wet. And the whole thing, I'm walking to the service, and everybody goes, ah! They're looking at me instead of, oh, they're, ah! they're looking at me like that. And then, of course, my cake is drooping and it's falling apart. And then my father, my father, my father, they forgot that the kissing of the bride of my own wedding. It was the worst day of my life. You can have that story. 
Or you could say, oh, do you know what happened at my wedding? <laughs> we had this car and it stalled and we were 40 minutes late and then it was pouring and I came in it was all wet and dripping and muddy and, and, then, and then the cake, it was all dripping. And you know what? Same details. But how are you going to respond? See, you have a choice. I talked to Danny, my son-in-law, just this week. I thought I'm going to use this message. I better talk to him about it. <laughs> He's, he's always saying, Dad, can you include me in the stories? Can you pull? So I thought, okay. I'll. So, so I asked him, I said, Danny, remember your wedding, you know, back in 2001? What do you think about your wedding? He said, oh, man, that was a great day. I said, remember the cake? Remember how you had to melt down the day before the wedding because everything was so precise and you didn't understand what precise meant? You know, details that you didn't understand and expectations that you could. Do you remember that? He says, oh, yeah, I remember that. He says, remember how I forgot to let the bride kiss, you know, you kissed your bride. He said, oh, yeah, I remember. I remember. So I remember, I remember doing that. I said, Danny, when you look back, would you do it differently? He actually said it this way. He says, you know, I didn't even ask the question. He said, you know, Dad, when I look back, I would not change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing. That is part of our story right now. The fact that the cake wasn't right, the fact that you forgot the kissing of the bride, that's all part of the excitement. You see, your lives, by the way, there will be many things that don't go well, and you have a choice you can make it part of your great story that is excitement in life. You say, but this was the worst thing in my life. Everything fell apart and, and it just got worse and worse. But there was something about the strength of God that could have been present there. And if you drew upon the strength of God, if you drew upon the life of God, it would have been refreshing to you and life to you. You get to choose your response in the story. Point number four, you get to choose the end of the story. Now, you know, there, there's some certainties in life. We all are going to pay taxes, part of Canadian culture. Second thing is we all are going to die. I don't know how you're going to die. I don't know when you're going to die. I don't know the circumstances, but the reality of it is we are all going to die unless our Lord Jesus comes beforehand. But you get to choose how that death is going to play out. You say, well, I get to choose whether I die in my bed and peacefully. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. You get to choose how that end is going to play out. Jesus, it says, because of the joy, Hebrews chapter 12, it says, because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the death that was before him. It talks about David, how David, when he was about to die, he realized he was about to die, and he says, I'm going to set things up for my children, my son specifically, Solomon, as he, so he can build the temple and establish the purpose for God. To, he was planning ahead for his death. It says that Stephen, when he was dying, it says that he looked into, into the heavens and he saw Jesus there. And as he saw Jesus, even as he was being stoned to death, he saw Christ and he, it says that, it, Scripture says he radiated his visions, vis, his nature just radiated like Christ, like an angel. And he chose how he was going to respond in his death. And we have that choice as we are going to, how we're going to respond in our death. Aristotle said that there are six, six, six main themes in writings, whether it's a, a prose or whatever, there's six main themes, and he, he lists those themes. Some people have said there's a seventh theme as well. But he says there's the theme of a quest or a journey. There's a theme of voyage and return. There's a theme of rebirth or comedy or tragedy, overcoming the monster or evil. There's a theme of rags to riches. And some have added some other, another one. They said there's a theme of, of love gained. But interestingly, in all of the themes, if there is to be a good story, there needs to be a transformation. Every good story. Now, there's lots of bad stories, but every good story, there's something that's transformed in a good way. What about your life? What about your message, your story? Is there, is there a transformation taking place there? Is there something that's changing? And it has to be such that it gives glory to God. The fifth point is that we need to get God's help because without the help of God, you can't just get up this morning and say, okay, I'm going to determine that when my tire's flat and when somebody sprays me with water as I'm, water as I'm trying to change the tire, I'm going to give glory to God and I'm going to have a good response. No, you're going to need the help of God. Jesus speaks in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, without me, you can do nothing. 
You've got this storyline that God has created. There's parameters, and good responses, bad responses, but without the help of God, you can do nothing. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, there's this, there's this thing that's been irritating me. There's this, there's this thorn in the flesh, and I don't like what's happening. I don't like the script that's in front of my life. I don't like it's pl- how it's played out. And he says, three times I sought God. He said, God, change this. Remove this thing. Alter the script. Make my life different. And God said, no, I'm not going to do that. My strength will be made perfect in your weakness. And my strength and my enablement will be there for you. And God says, therefore, Paul says, therefore I will gladly, gladly focus on my weaknesses because he learned that when I am weak, that Christ, God's power is there and his strength. And you see, in the situations of our life and the challenging things that we are going through, God is saying, there is a strength for you. And it's not that automatically you can say, all right, this turned out nice and rosy and beautifully. But the key thing is, it will turn out, yes, with the strength of God. And you'll be able to say, yeah, it was a miserable time, but God was there. Yes, I went through some battles, but as a family, we learned, we gathered together closer than ever before. We prayed more diligently than, it was the best of times, even though everything else was falling apart, because there was something that God wanted to do deep in your lives, and you need his help and his strength to overcome that and to the, overcome our nature, our selfish nature, and to walk in the fullness that God has for you. What about your life? What is your story? Does it provoke people to jealousy? 17 years ago, there was a lady, 28 years of age, Roxanne was her name. She was in a church service. I don't think it was one of our church services, but somebody shared the gospel in this church service, and she realized that she needed Jesus Christ into her life. And she responded. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. And there started to be things changing where she was a pretty worldly person. Her, a person, her values changed. And she started, she had three daughters. She started to raise them differently. And within a couple of years, her, her daughters had given her, their lives to the Lord. And her husband also had become a Christian and was walking with the Lord. Uh, so two years after she's a believer, all of a sudden she started to feel that there were some problems. So things weren't right with her in her lower stomach region. And she went to a doctor and the doctor said, you know what, you've got cancer. Got cancer in the lower, lower abdomen. And uh, they said, you know, we're going to do some radiation th- treatments and we're going to put you in chemo. And they did that and they operated. And through the three processes, still nothing was able to stop. It was a very aggressive cancer. Nothing was able to stop that aggressive nature that was there. And it had metastasized, started to go through her whole, whole abdomen region, her whole chest region. Uh, that was t- started two years after she became a believer. She went to the health science hospital and she was there for years. They were doing treatments and chemo and trying to do surgery and trying to just stop the aggressive nature of the cancer that was there. Uh, when they got to the point there was only six months left for her to live, they said, you know what, we can't do anything here. We've got the expertise, but you really need to be just at a place where they will just nurture and care for you and maintain the pain, the pain because we can't actually help you here. So Roxanne went to the Steinbeck Hospital and she was there for the last six months of her life. When she was in the health sciences and when she was in the hospital in Steinbeck, people would come and they'd know about her situation. They would come and so they'd say, you know, Roxanne, you're 33 years of age. I'm just so sorry for you. I'm so sorry that you won't get to watch your children, your young girls grow up to be young ladies. And I'm sorry that you won't be able to live a fruitful life with them and that you won't be able to take them to their dance and their music recitals and that they're going to be without a mother and your husband's going to be having to raise these children all on their own. I'm just so sorry for you. And she would start to talk about this love that Jesus has for her. She would talk about the fullness of Christ within her and how she's not missing anything because she knows she will see them in eternity. She said, and she would talk to them about how there is this hope for something better, which has to be in eternity. And there would be those people that would come. There would be those people that would visit her and those people in rooms beside, in in beds beside her when she passed away, which is just about exactly 11 years from today. It was January 11 years ago. Uh, I was able to officiate the services right here in the sanctuary. 
And there were 350 people. They were filled in the pink chairs into the blue chairs that were here. And these were not just friends. These were the nurses and the doctors from the hospital in Steinbeck and from the health sciences. They were, the, they were the, the medical care people, the support people were there. They were the, the cleaning ladies and they were the custodial people. They were people who were in the bed next door. And they lived and she didn't. They were at the funeral. They were the people who were in the, the bed next to hers. It was the family of those people. And many of those people were, were greed because of what she was going through. In the last days of her life, she actually could no longer eat or, or drink because the, the cancer had so much blocked everything. So she ended up the last two weeks, she actually starved to death. Her body just consumed all its energy, consumed its own tissues, and there was just bones, basically, was right there. But in the midst of it, she had this peace and this beauty about Jesus Christ. So much so that the congregation, it wasn't a congregation, but the people here, most of them were not Christians. But she had impacted their life. There was something about her dying at the end of a story, a transformed life that they wanted. And they wanted to hear about what was taking place in her. Beloved, you have a story. God set you in parameters. I don't know why, but he has a reason for it. And you have a choice on how you're going to respond to the situations today. You have a choice to draw upon his strength and his wisdom and his understanding to help you through it so that you'll be able to say, God was there. And that is present all the way to when you die. Do we have a story that God, others would say, man, I'm jealous I wish I had a God like that working on my behalf. Not because you had the miracle, but God was there. And he was working in your life, in your heart. That's what God is wanting. And that's what will bring life to you. Will you stand? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he talks about how we have this ministry and it is shown in times of tribulation and oppression, when we've been beaten and when we're in turmoil and when we're pressed down. He says, we have this ministry through good things and in bad things that happen. We have this ministry, this story, this testimony. That's given to all of you. What is the strength for you? You're all in a story. How is it going to turn out? The last point of mine, you need the strength of God. It's only when you have the transforming power of Jesus Christ within you, giving you his perspective and his understanding, that's when true life comes and the true story is made. Without that, it's an empty story. I'm not going to embarrass any of you. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to call you forward, but I'd just like you to bow your heads. If you are not in a living relationship with Jesus Christ, if you need the power of him upon you in your story, I want to give you an opportunity right now. I'm not going to single you out or embarrass you, but with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you say, yeah, that's what I need, I just want you to raise your hand and say, yeah, this is what I need. Thank you, ma'am, on the side. Anybody else? As simple as that. You say, yeah, I got to identify. Say, I need that strength of God. I need that relationship with him. Thank you. The blue section here. There's others as well here. Where are you? Take the time. Don't miss it now. This is the key thing for you. Okay, some of you put up your hands. You can put them down. Others of you, you know, yeah, I need that. Maybe some of you are like Samson. Samson at the end of his life, you know, he had wasted his life. He lived in sin at the end of his life. He said, God, let my life come for something. And God did something great at the end of his life. Maybe you've wasted, wasted your life too. And I want you to join in prayer. And congregation, let's join together. Put up your hand. And if you should have put up your hand, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come before you. I need your help. You've, you've ordered my life. You've placed situations around me. But I want my story to turn out well. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I invite you to work within me. Give me your strength. Give me your perspective so that I can live for you. Lord, take away my sins. And thank you that you bring in me into a relationship with you. As I go from here, let my story be a transformed one by the power of yourself. Amen.
Amen.